Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen moderators, Brother Neubauer, I wish to get right to the matters that are before us this week. First thing I want to ask, though, what Bible passage applies to anyone today? During the last debate that took place in September, I asked that question a number of times all four nights. No passage was ever presented. Perhaps Brother Neubauer can present us one this evening, or we'll get to one uh, by uh, sometime uh, by the end of this debate. Second thing I want to bring to your attention is Brother William Bell is sitting with Brother Neubauer and Brother Basden. Brother Bell uh, has been marked as a divider of churches, false teacher, and so on. And Brother Neubauer and Brother Basden have uh, repeatedly said they're not in fellowship with Brother Bell. That's sort of strange that they would have someone assisting them in debate that they're not in fellowship with. They're not in fellowship with Don Preston, and Brother Bell's definitely in fellowship with Don Preston. In fact, uh, all three of these men have appeared with Brother Preston on a fairly regular basis. They appeal to one another for help in uh, this subject matter. So I would like to know if Brother Neubauer is in fellowship, indeed in fellowship, with Brother William Bell. And let the brotherhood know that, uh, and don't hem or haw around about it. I think he understands uh, what's involved in that. Now I'm in the affirmative, which means it is my duty to set out my case for the proposition I'm affirming, it is Mr. Neubauer's obligation as the negative to follow me and address the points that I'm making. He did not do that in the two nights I was in the affirmative in uh, South Haven, Michigan. But uh, we'll see if he can do better in this debate. My proposition states the scriptures teach that the general resurrection of the dead is yet future and is a bodily resurrection. I define the terms of my proposition uh, simply as follows. By scriptures, I mean the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments. By teach, I mean imparts information or instruction. By the general resurrection, I refer to the resurrection associated in the scriptures with the final coming of Jesus Christ, entailing the resurrection of both the just and the unjust. And by the way, the word resurrection... Uh, implies certain things. We'll have something to say about that in a moment. The phrase yet future refers to the fact that it has not been realized as of yet. By bodily resurrection, I refer to the fact that the dead will be raised utilizing their individual bodies as per Romans 8, 11 and other passages. Now, concerning the word resurrection, the word resurrection implies that something that is dead is being raised back to life. Further, it implies that uh, it was in the state of being dead prior to resurrection. Further, it implies that at some point in time it entered into death and that there was an adequate cause that was responsible for causing its death. In other words, it killed it. It also implies that it had to have been alive before it died and that it had to come into the state of being alive before it could die. Everyone understands this concerning the nature of the word resurrection. I submit they're going to have to change the definition of that word. In fact, they're going to have to change the definition of a lot of words in order to maintain their doctrine, and in reality they do. Christ, or the, the uh, resurrection, implies all of these things. And we ought to be asking ourselves concerning his own position when he uh, is in the affirmative, and even when he is in the negative trying to answer me, how long was whatever is being raised uh, spiritually dead? Because it is his belief that it is a spiritual resurrection. If he says it is the church, the corporate body, 
view, uh, which he affirmed in the last debate, how long was the church spiritually dead? When specifically did it die? How long was the church alive before dying? When did the church actually come into existence in the state of being alive? And what specifically killed it? He needs to address all of that if he's going to hold to the corporate body view. Whether it's the church or some other entity, he needs to address those points. In clarifying my proposition, we need to note that the resurrection uh, that he teaches is only a spiritual resurrection. That the resurrection relative to the just entails the physical body being the final product of the act of the resurrection is not uh, a uh, necessary part. These are things that I am not affirming. I am not affirming that the resurrection of damnation for the unjust involves the same conditions and results as the resurrection of life does for the righteous. Now, I'm also not affirming that the resurrection is purely a material resurrection. He will try to leave that impression that it is purely a physical material one. It is my position. It's what he'll accuse me of, which is not the case at all. As to the comings of Christ, it should be noted that Christ has come or appeared several times, in fact, numerous times in different senses, as per the teaching of the Scriptures. He ridiculed this in the last debate, but really did not address it. Jesus came, literally, as the babe of Bethlehem through means of the virgin birth. He came through the person and work of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost as He promised the apostles. By the way, Matthew 10, 23 is a passage that applies to Pentecost. And, but He's going to apply it to A.D. 70. And when He does, He's in a self-contradiction. Further, He came through the agency of dreams and visions appearing, for example, to Paul in visions on special occasions during the miraculous era. He is said to come in some sense with the Father in order to abide with those who keep His Word and enter in some sense into the hearts of those who obey the gospel, Revelation 3, verse 20. Does Holger believe that Christ does so today? Further, Christ came through the agency of the Roman army in judgment on the, in the destruction of Jerusalem. And by the way, if He came literally, visibly, and so on, uh, then that rules out the idea of agency. We'll look at that more in a moment. Further, he came in judgment upon the Roman Empire through the calamities and armies that invaded it. In fact, Daniel prophesied of the destruction of the Roman Empire by the church, by the kingdom. Daniel 2, 44 and 45. He has also come in various judgments providentially upon evil nations over the centuries. As Psalm 9 verse 17 affirms, the wicked shall be turned into hell, and every nation that forgets God. I asked Brother Neubauer in the last debate if God still judges nations in such a fashion. And all he could say was, maybe. Maybe. So if you have an evil nation today that arises uh, according to such a view, uh, would uh, it be... Good? Would it be right? Would it be proper if God doesn't judge in such a fashion to pray that God do so, that God intervene? Was it, a, was it a good thing for brethren to pray for the destruction, for example, of the, of the Nazi uh, German nation of, of that empire as they were killing six million Jews? That'd be an interesting... Or has Brother Neubauer now become a full-blown deist. He also promised, that is, Christ, to come to remove the candlestick of the Ephesian church, as well as the, the punish the, uh, those at Pergamos, Thyatira, and so on, churches that all continued to exist well after A.D. 70. He will also come again just as He left the earth. Now, I want you to pay very close attention to this. He will come visibly and personally, just as prophesied in Acts 1, 
verses 9 through 11. Acts 1, 9 through 11. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went, went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as you have seen him go into heaven. Now, how did he leave? Notice the words that stress the idea of physical, literal sight. Keep in mind, this is an historical document. This is a book written by Dr. Luke that is historical, literal prose. It's not poetic language. It is not figurative language. It is not a motif which implies the idea of figurative language. It involves literal language. Luke, as Sir William Ramsey said, was a historian of the first rank. And he is writing about a historical event. This really happened. It's not fiction. By the way, Brother Bell's good buddy, Don Preston, now holds to a view of Genesis chapters 1 through 11, or he's at least endorsed a book that holds to the view that Genesis 1 through 11 is myth. Is myth. And I'd like to know if these brethren agree with that, or if they're going to ignore that altogether. This is historical fact. Now watch. When he had spoken these things, they beheld as he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. Notice again the emphasis upon literal sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, again sight, who also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into, up into heaven? Emphatically stressing the idea of sight. This same Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go. I would like to bring up the questions that, that we, if we could bring those up, the questions that we asked this evening concerning Brother Newbauer. If we could get those on the board real quick. Don't have them. Well, I kind of threw you a curve on that. But I think this is important. These are literal uses of terms. And it is with that understanding and in view of this text that we ask specific questions concerning the coming of Christ as per Acts, 8, uh, Acts 1 verse 11. And I want you to notice very carefully as soon as we have that just what these men have, in effect, admitted. And what they'll have to do, what they'll have to do is claim, well, that wasn't our intent of the meaning of those words. Now what? Do we have them? Not this speech. We'll have them the next speech. In fact, if, let me have them. Let me have them right now. I think this is significant. They should be down there. I got them. Yeah. Now I want you to watch. Number three, Jesus was to return the same way he left at his ascension. What does that mean in plain English? Do you have any trouble understanding that? True or false? Jesus was to return the same way he left at his ascension. He said true. Well, he left literally, physically, visibly, and so on. He was uh, changed. 
He left bodily, but he returned, or is to return bodily. So keep that in mind. He was to return the same way he left at his ascension. He said, true. He cited 1 John 3, 2. 1 John 3, 2 says, We shall see him even as he is, for we shall be like him. Now, are you exactly like Jesus in your spiritual body now? Are you glorified as he is? Are you immortal in your physical body? Has it been upgraded to an immortal spiritual body? You're clearly in the physical body right now. Jesus has a spiritual body. His was uh, glorified. Jesus returned literally. Here's the next one. Personally, visibly in A.D. 70. And is visible today. Now, do you have any trouble understanding the meaning of those words? Guess what he said? True. True. Well, I'd like his address. Do you know where he now exactly lives? His specific address. We're talking about it personally, Jesus Christ. Now watch it, brethren. They're nodding in agreement. They're nodding in agreement that Jesus is literally, personally, on this planet. That's their position. He's no longer in heaven at all. He's right now on this planet. And he just nodded in agreement. Note that. In effect, he's just admitted my argument. My argument is that Jesus was to come literally, he was to come visibly, and he is to come personally. And they're saying, yes, that's the way he's to come. The only thing is, they're saying that happened in A.D. 70 which is an absolute absurdity. That is absurd. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 says, Every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him will see him. Now that's the Bible. Every eye. Has every eye seen him? They're trying to say, in fact, Brother Bazden wrote, that believers see him. I guess unbelievers can't see him. And he just nodded his head there. So notice that. So if you're an unbeliever, you can't see him. I guess he sort of fades in and out like a phantasm. That that's what we've got here. What they're going to try to say is, oh, he's here in the person of the corporate body. But brethren, that's a figure of speech. That's figurative. That's not literal. We are using these terms literally. Just as the terms that are used here in Acts 1 verse 11 were literal. The questions were literal. The verses are literal. And this is where we are. And so he's given up his doctrine. And he can get up and quibble all day long about the corporate body being Jesus here on earth. But that's a figure of speech and he knows it. That's a metaphor and uh, is not a literal fulfillment as is required by this specific text. One other thing I want to bring to your attention. According to Brother Baisden, this is a fellowship issue, but only if you understand the doctrine. If you have come to understand the doctrine, and you reject it, then you're lost. Now, in the previous debate, Brother Neubauer affirmed that uh, all persons, all accountable persons, are amenable to this doctrine. In other words, you must believe it. Brother Basden says, no, that's not true. He says that you're only amenable if you understand the doctrine. You've heard it and you understand it. You're then amenable. For those of you who might be concerned about becoming amenable, we have some uh, cotton balls for your ears. So if you don't hear what he teaches, 
then you're not amenable to his doctrine. We'll see if he's consistent on that aspect of things. Thank you.